Chapter 57, Fourth Year, A Gathering Storm Sunday, the 1st of September, 1974 As Remus approached King's Cross Station for the fourth time in his early life, he felt utterly invincible. He had grown taller still over the summer, and his face had changed too. No longer childish and round, his jaw was set and his eyes mean. In his heavy black boots, polished to a shine that morning, and his smart new clothes, Remus felt a stronger sense of identity than he ever had. Stee had been very keen to give him a tattoo before he returned to school, but Remus had balked at that. He'd had enough marks already. They'll all think you've joined a gang, Matron tutted, barely concealing her disdain as she dropped him outside the station. You look like a delinquent. Piss off, he muttered. What do you care? She gave him a sharp clip around the ear, and he winced. She had to reach up to do that these days, but she still knew exactly where it hurt most. "'You'll be at school before it gets dark, won't you?' she said, business-like. He nodded, sullen. It was a full moon that night. "'Good,' she nodded. "'See you next summer, then?' He entered the station alone and walked through the crowds with a practised masculine gait, Legs apart, hands balled into fists. People moved quickly out of his way as he approached, and a station guard eyed him suspiciously. Remus ignored them all and strode forward, purposefully, directly through the ticket barrier, bursting onto platform nine and three quarters without so much as flinching. He was late, and the platform was already mostly empty, with only a few last tearful parents of first years lingering to wave goodbye. A cursory glance told Remus that the other three marauders were already on the train, so he climbed aboard and headed straight for their usual compartment, pushing roughly past the other students, many of whom seemed very small to him now as he struggled with his battered old trunk. They were in there, all three sitting squashed up on the same side of the compartment, huddled behind the morning edition of the Daily Prophet. All right, Remus said as he entered. James, who was sat in the middle, holding the paper, lowered it, and three pairs of eyes stared up at Remus. Peter looked white and nervous, which was pretty normal, and began to chew on his lip, glancing at James for an appropriate response. James smiled, trying to be friendly, but his brown eyes wandered over Remus, from his steel-toed boots to his closely shaven head. Sirius was hardest to read. His eyes widened slightly, but his expression remained neutral. Rumor slung himself into the seat opposite, as if he'd not noticed. Good summer? Not bad, James said cautiously. The usual, you know. How was yours? Yeah, good. Remus withdrew a small tin case from his back pocket and opened it to reveal five pre-rolled cigarettes. He placed one between his lips and lit it with a match as the train began to pull away from the station. We were worried when we didn't hear from you. Sorry, busy. Remus shrugged, exhaling smoke. Doing what? Sirius asked bluntly. James got up to open the window and let the smoke out, but he didn't say anything about it. Just busy, Remus said. They kept secrets from him, after all. He didn't have to tell them everything. Are you okay, Remus? James asked finally. Has something happened? Nope. You seem different. Your clothes, Peter squeaked suddenly. I've seen muggles dress like it, Sirius finally spoke up. It's cool, right, Remus? Remus shrugged again, feeling pleased, but hoping he looked outwardly nonchalant. The mate's got them for me, that's all, he said. Oh, well, if it's a muggle thing, James said uncertainly. You sure you're okay? Lay off, Potter, Remus sighed, rolling his eyes. He didn't want to talk about it anymore, though he'd expected, even wanted a reaction. He didn't like the way they were all staring at him. Typical purebloods. They could prance around in hundred-year-old robes and stupid pointed hats and nobody said a word, 
but Jeans and Doc Martens were apparently a step too far. What are you reading then? He asked, nodding at the newspaper, hoping to distract them. James looked gravely down at the broadsheet in his lap. The war, he said, handing Remus the prophet. War? That made him sit up straight. What war? He looked down at the headlines, which read, Jenkins criticised as security measures on ministry tightened. Didn't you know? James looked incredulous. The wizarding world has been officially at war since 1970. Sirius and Peter nodded solemnly. We weren't even at Hogwarts in 1970, Remus said defensively. I hardly knew anything about wizards then. I mean, who are we fighting? That's the problem, James said brusquely. It's too difficult to know. But this Dark Lord person has been gathering a lot of allies. Almost all pure blood. I reckon those are the meetings my family are going to, Sirius said, his voice low, even though they were alone. James's dad agrees with me. Is that why the Slytherins are such a pleasure to be around? Remus asked, connecting the dots. Yep, Sirius said, and it'll be worse this year, you can bet. There were some attacks this summer, James said nervously, on muggles and a few mixed-blood families. They think the Dark Lord is using dangerous creatures, Peter said, his voice trembling with fear. But vampires and giants and... and... Rima shot him a look, and his jaw clenched. And werewolves? Mooney, James started. I need the loo. Rima stood up, quickly, exiting the compartment. He stormed through the train, younger students leaping out of his way as he passed them, terrified. He didn't need the loo, obviously. But there wasn't exactly anywhere else to go, so he locked himself inside a cubicle at the far end of the carriage. It was much posher than the loos on a muggle train, with actual red velvet curtains in the windows and glimmering gold fixtures. The mirror even had a gilt frame. He stared at himself for a few minutes, glaring into his own eyes, clenching the side of the sink until his knuckles turned white. He'd thought he would be so tough after this summer, thought that nothing could touch him now. But everything was already unravelling, faster than he had expected, and he'd lost it at the very first mention of werewolves. How would he ever do what he needed to be done if he couldn't stay calm? Greyback would eat him for breakfast. Unable to look at himself any longer, Rumors sat on the toilet seat and considered punching the soap dispenser. That probably wouldn't provide the satisfaction he needed, and he'd only end up covered in floral-scented pink slime. He kicked the basin with his boot instead, leaving a long black rubber streak on the white porcelain. Fuck, he muttered. That felt good. Fuck, he shouted, kicking the basin again. Who's in there? A sharp rap came at the door. Bugger off, it's occupied, he shouted back fiercely. This is a Slytherin carriage, you know, the voice said coldly. Oh, fuck off, you stupid busybody, Rumish replied, slamming the door with his elbow. If he had been in a more reasonable state, he might have calmly explained that the carriages were not divided into houses, and actually anyone could sit wherever they wanted, even if it was a closed toilet seat. I shall call for a prefect. Oh, my God, Rumish stood up, withdrawing his wand. Are you looking for a fight or something? He flung the door open finding himself face to face with a very shocked-looking Severus Snape. Severus might have frightened him when they were both eleven, but at fourteen, Remus towered over Snape now, and with his wand raised and his face screwed up in annoyance, he must have been a terrifying sight. You! They both hissed. Snape tossed his black, greasy hair and sneered. What were you doing in there? None of your business. Out my way. What are you wearing? Snape pulled a face, looking him up and down with disgust. Are those muggle clothes? 
So what if they are? Rumours took a step forward, now so close to the Slytherin boy that he was practically breathing on him. Got something to say? Not so big without your creepy mates around, are you, Snivellus? He gave him a hard shove, knocking Snape to the floor. Snape glared up at him, scrambling to his feet quickly and dusting off his shabby black robes. He narrowed his eyes. You'll find out all about my mates this year, loony lupin. I promise you that, he said very coldly. Not exactly in a position to be giving out threats, though, are you? Remus replied, almost conversationally. I've heard that lot prefer purebloods, and Lily's told me all about you, Snape. Snape's eyes flashed, and a look of pure hatred crossed his face. He reached for his wand, but whether it was thanks to the closeness of the full moon, or just pure adrenaline, Remus was too quick for him. He grabbed Severus's wrist and slammed it against the wall of the carriage, causing the Slytherin to cry out and drop his wand. Then, thinking of nothing but causing the most pain possible, Remus snapped his head forward and butted Severus, knocking him down a second time. Snape was staring up at him, his black eyes shining with fear and rage. He clutched his robes against his nose, which was now gushing blood. Remus, feeling no better about any of it, spat on the floor and stepped over Snape. There's your warning for the rest of the year, he growled. Stay out my way. Snape said nothing, but didn't try to get up. Remus walked away, confident the other boy wouldn't try anything now. He stalked back the way he'd came, trying to get away from the rich, intoxicating smell of blood, and shut himself in the first empty compartment he came across. There he sat, breathing deeply for a few minutes, trying to bring his heartbeat back under control, and to ignore the craving that was echoing somewhere deep inside him, where human reason could not touch. Eventually, with shaking hands, he pulled out another cigarette and smoked it broodingly, staring out the window. He was not alone for long. Mooney, the door slid open, and Sirius's head poked around the door. Remus glared at him, but Sirius came in anyway and sat opposite. All right, what's up? Nothing. Remus crossed his arms and slid down in the seat, staring at his boots. The laces didn't match, red on the left, yellow on the right. He'd thought they'd look really cool back in July, but now it looked a bit silly. Something's up. You're not yourself. How would you know? Remus spat in reply. Maybe this is who I really am. I just know, Sirius replied, uncharacteristically calm. Apparently spending so much time at the Potters had done wonders for his patience. It's okay to be angry sometimes, Remus. It doesn't mean anything except that you're normal. Remus looked up at him, surprised. Sirius smiled understandingly, then smirked. And for what it's worth, I really do think you look so bloody cool. Really? Yeah, kind of dangerous. Remus snorted at the irony. Thanks. So, bad summer, was it? Remus shrugged. It was okay. I was... I did a lot of stuff. I don't want James to know about it. Okay, Sirius agreed, then cocked his head brightly. Can I try a cigarette? He pronounced the word as if it was new to him, with a slightly French accent which was oddly endearing. Remus felt a surge of affection for his friend, which sent his heart pounding again. He fished for a fag from his case and tossed it over with matches. He watched Sirius carefully purse his lips around the white paper cylinder, strike a match and cup his hands close to his face. He didn't cough, which was bloody impressive in itself, but only took a shallow breath before exhaling and making a sour face. You get used to it, Remus smirked. Okay. Sirius tried again, inhaling more this time. It was weirdly hypnotic watching Sirius smoke. The haze of bluish-grey made the carriage feel more intimate and private. Remus began to relax for the first time in months, 
as if something inside of him was unclenching, slowly. He looked at Sirius and thought, why not? I found out some things, end of last term, he said quietly, looking at his boots again. He reached into his shirt pocket and withdrew the three newspaper clippings that Ferox had given him last year. He handed them to Sirius, who reached through the smoke with long white fingers to receive them. I don't want to talk about it yet, Rumor said quickly, but read them if you like. Okay, Sirius nodded gently. Thank you, Remus. Chapter 58, Fourth Year, Competition Remus's bad start to the year did not improve when the train drew into the station. They arrived in Hogsmeade with only 20 minutes or so until sunset, and Remus found Madame Pomfrey waiting for him, looking anxious. Good luck, Mooney, Sirius said under his breath as they parted ways amongst the throng of excited black-robed students. Remus nodded grimly, and Sirius gave his shoulder a nudge with his own, a show of adolescent solidarity. Remus only had time to glance wistfully back at the other three marauders climbing into one of the horseless carriages, one blonde, two dark, before Madame Pomfrey seized Remus by the elbow and without warning apparated to the shrieking shack. There was a blue and white plate sitting on the dusty mantelpiece with a thick chicken sandwich on top. In case you're peckish, the nurse explained. You've still a bit of time. He was starving hungry, but couldn't bring himself to eat it. Instead, he just sat down on his cot and waited to be locked in, wishing there was at least a bit of light in the dingy room. Remus thought about the feast, arguably his favourite part of the first night, other than sleeping in his big, comfortable bed. Neither would be happening tonight. He could smell a rabbit outside, snuffling in the grass, and his stomach gave a fierce growl. He looked at the sandwich again and considered it, but as pain shot through his shoulder blades, he realised he had waited too long. The wolf was on its way. Monday, the 2nd of September, 1974. One might assume that a hungry werewolf would quite fancy a chicken sandwich, but apparently only raw meat would do, and Remus awoke to find that the little meal remained intact while his arms and legs were ripped to shreds. He sighed heavily, hauled himself to his feet, and went to sit on the bunk again. His hip had gone funny for the third time, and his limp was exaggerated as he staggered across the room. His left shoulder felt dislocated. Thank God it wasn't his right, because he had a lot of homework to catch up on. Closing his eyes, Remus slouched back against the wall to wait for Madame Pomfrey. It was dawn, and the marauders probably wouldn't be up for a few more hours, unless James decided he needed to squeeze some flying in before lessons. Remus knew that it was Harpreet Singh's final year at Hogwarts, which meant that the position of Quidditch captain would be open next year, and James was not messing about. Accio sandwich, Remus rasped, finding his wand under the bed. The entire plate came flying towards him at such a speed that it hit the wall and shattered only inches away from his head. Groaning, Remus brushed away the shards of porcelain and began to pick hungrily at the stale bread. Madame Pomfrey soon arrived and set to work patching him up before accompanying him back to the castle. He insisted on walking rather than having her conjure a stretcher. I'm really not that bad, he cajoled. You've done a great job on my shoulder. I reckon I'm fine to go to lessons. I don't like the look of that limp, she replied. Hospital wing first. We'll see how you are at lunchtime. But it's my first day. He knew he was whinging, but he had to try. I'm sorry, Remus. Anyway, look at you. You're dead on your feet. A few hours sleep and you'll feel much better. Much to Madame Pomfrey's dismay, James, Peter and Sirius were waiting outside the hospital doors for Remus, meaning that sleep would have to be put off for a little bit longer. How'd James get you two up this early? Remus grinned at them. It wasn't easy, James grinned back, Sirius stifling a yawn behind him. I had to resort to threats of violence. An 
actual violence, Peter said, rubbing his arm, which looked very red. You okay, Mooney? Sirius asked, blinking a lot as if to look more alert. Fine, cheers, Remus nodded as Pomfrey ushered him into the room. The marauders waited patiently while Remus undressed behind a screen and climbed into his usual bed at the far end of the ward. Fifteen minutes, Adam Pomfrey snapped, carrying over a sleeping draught. He needs his rest, boys. We can't stay long anyway, James said. Lessons and everything. We brought your new timetable, Mooney. He handed over the sheet. Remus studied it carefully. Ferox's lessons were at the end of the week, so at least he wasn't missing those. But he had McGonagall and runes, and history today. Could you? He started. We'll get your homework, Mooney. Don't worry, Sirius said, amused. Nice to see you back to normal. Yeah, Remus raised an eyebrow stretching out a bare arm to display his fresh claw marks. Can't get much more normal than me. He did feel much better once he'd slept the morning away. The anger which had torn him up for the past few months was still very present, but in some small way it had shifted, and he was able to think about other things. At Hogwarts, he felt better equipped to control his temper. He felt grounded and somewhat saner, as much as he didn't like to admit it to himself, Remus was beginning to feel more and more at home in the wizarding world than the muggle one. In addition, he felt surprisingly positive about having given Sirius the paper clippings. They had been burning a hole in his pocket all summer, and he was glad to get rid of them, to let someone else in on the secret. Pomfrey allowed him to leave for dinner, and he tried to slip into the Great Hall without too much fuss. This plan was scrapped, however, as he was rugby tackled by very three excitable girls. Remus! They all shrieked, capturing him in a tight hug. Hi, he gasped, trying not to wince as Marlene squeezed his freshly mended ribs. We didn't see you on the train, Mary said. And you weren't in ruins, Lily added. Did you have a good summer? Marlene asked, her voice slightly muffled under Mary's arm. Yeah, great, thanks. Remus straightened his clothes as they finally released him, standing back and grinning at him. I wasn't feeling well, but I'm okay now. How were your summers? Great! Mary pulled him towards the Gryffindor table, where the marauders were watching on with a mix of amusement and envy. He shrugged at them helplessly, as he was manhandled into his seat. Wait until you hear what me and Darren did, not at dinner! Lily said, sounding exasperated. Remus doesn't want to hear what you got up to with your boyfriend. Remus's eyes widened. He certainly did not want to hear. And he flashed a grateful look at Lily, who smiled back. The girls all looked a bit different. Remus was so tall now that he hardly noticed other people growing. But Mary, Marlene and Lily definitely had. They looked less like the kids he remembered from first year, and now reminded him of the girls that Stee and his gang whistled at when they were out in town. Mary, particularly, had developed noticeable curves at some point, and Remus couldn't ignore the fact that half of the boys on the Gryffindor table were staring at the way her white school shirt pulled across her chest. "'Oi, ladies!' Sirius called from further up the table. "'Can we have Mooney back, please?' "'No,' Mary replied, sticking out a pink tongue. She turned back to Remus. I really like your hair. Anvi said she saw you on the train and you were dressed like a skinhead. You haven't actually joined a gang now, have you? Remus shrugged. Fortunately, the food appeared at that moment, providing a decent enough distraction. Unfortunately, girls were not like boys when it came to eating. While the marauders would have simply tucked in, heads down until they finished, Lily and Marlene picked at their food slowly, chatting about school and who was going out with who and their new favourite actor. Marlene fancies a Slytherin, Mary said slyly. I do not, Mary turned bright red. Oh, you do so. I saw you watching him in potions. We're doing potions with the Slytherins again then, Rumors asked, his stomach sinking. Yep. Lily said brightly. 
I think it's better, don't you? Slughorn always gives much more detail when it comes to his own house. Oh yeah, I forgot, Mary cocked an eyebrow. Lily has had a crush on a Slytherin for years. Severus is my friend, Lily replied witheringly. You're boy mad. I can't help it if I'm more experienced than you lot. Mary raised her chin in a very dignified, mature sort of way. Marlene covered her ears dramatically. If you're going to start talking about Darren doing that again, I'm leaving. Fine, fine, Mary laughed lightly. I'll shut up. She didn't, though. She and Marlene ended in a very intense debate over who was more attractive, David Essex or Donny Osmond. Remus took the opportunity to whisper to Lily. You've seen Sniv Severus today, then? Yeah, why? Um... Did he say anything about seeing me on the train? No, Lily sounded surprised. Why? What happened? Nothing, Rima said quickly. Just the usual, you know, him being a prat. Hmm, Lily replied, looking down at her food and playing with her fork. She seemed uncharacteristically nervous. He can be a bit of a prat, I suppose. She looked up again at Remus and lowered her voice even further so that he had to lean closer to hear her at all over the noise of the dining hall. It was just a theory lesson today, Potions, she whispered. We didn't have to partner up, so I wondered if you wanted to work together again this year. Oh, you don't want to do it with Snape? Lily looked very pink indeed and shook her head. No, I think, well, you're a lot less bossy and we study together so much anyway. I just thought. Yeah, sounds okay to me, Rumor shrugged, returning to his food. He really was starving hungry. That pleased him too. James and Sirius were always paired up. And so did Marlene and Mary. There was Peter, of course, but he actually had a lot of friends in Slytherin and tended to make mistakes when he was anxious, which annoyed Remus, who was sort of a perfectionist. Lily was a nice, sensible sort of girl, with a sense of humour, and she could always explain things to him so that they sounded easy. Plus, it would drive James bonkers. The Snape incident still bothered him slightly. He had half expected McGonagall to be waiting to pounce as soon as he was discharged from the hospital wing. Severus almost always went running to a teacher if he could get away with it. And Remus had been absolutely 100% in the wrong this time. He knew that much. Snape hadn't so much as laid a hand on him. Rumours had just humiliated him because he felt like it. And Snape did not like being humiliated. Rumours didn't know that much about the troubled Slytherin boy, other than bits and pieces Lily had confided. But he did know that Severus Snape could hold a grudge like no one else. He would have his revenge. And if it wasn't by getting Rumours into trouble with the teachers then it was going to be something far more unpleasant. So, what were the girls talking about? James asked, once they were all in their dorm room for the evening. He was trying to sound casual, but Remus saw through it. Oh, nothing interesting, he replied, unpacking his trunk. Boys, mostly, and snogging. Snogging? Sirius sat up in his bed. Yeah, I know. Remus scrunched his face to show his distaste for the topic. It's all they're interested in these days. Mary and her muggle boyfriend did something over the summer. What did they do? Sirius looked very interested now. Not disgusted at all, Remus realised. Uh, he faltered. Well, I don't really know. Lily wouldn't let her talk about it while we were eating. Ah, James nodded proudly. Too clever for all of that nonsense, Lily. How do you know it's nonsense? Sirius asked. It's not like you do any snogging. Oh, and you do, James frowned. Could if I wanted, Sirius said, lying down again, arms behind his head. Plenty of girls fancy me. If you wanted, James smirked. So what? You've got girls lining up for a cheeky snog and you're just not interested. An almost imperceptible look of panic crossed Sirius's face, 
only for the most fleeting of moments, before it returned to its usual impish cheek. Jealous, are you, Potter? Ugh, of you? James teased back. Bet Lily fancies me, Sirius said. Take that back, James roared, launching himself at his friend, wrestling him into a headlock. Peter sighed heavily and looked at Remus. They were like this all summer, he said glumly. Everything's a competition. Some hours later, Remus was just drifting off to sleep when his ears pricked and he heard those familiar footsteps crossing the room. Shortly, his bed curtain twitched aside and Sirius whispered, Mooney, you awake? Yeah. Sirius crawled inside. Remus sat up nervously. Sirius had only ever paid him a visit once before. Usually he went to James if he wanted to talk about, well, Remus didn't know what they talked about, but he assumed black family drama. The only time Sirius had sought out Remus was early in their second year, just after the marauders had discovered he was a werewolf. Remus thought back to the night occasionally, and the memory was tucked away in a safe, calm part of his mind. He remembered lifting his shirt so that Sirius could inspect his scars, long dark hair brushing his skin. Muffliato, Sirius whispered, casting the silencing spell. What's up? Remus asked, rubbing his eyes as Sirius lit his wand. The articles, Sirius said, pulling the clippings from his pyjama pocket. I read them. Oh. Remus felt a trickle of shame run down his spine. Right. I know you said you didn't want to talk about it, Sirius said quickly, but I just... Well, I wanted you to know that I've read them, I suppose. Okay, thanks, Remus nodded. And I understand why you're angry. Hmm? Anyone would be, Sirius said fervently, his eyes huge in the darkness, twin blue flames. It's, it's, it's just a shitty hand to be dealt, Mooney. Remus didn't know what to say to that. He could hardly disagree. I won't tell James, or Pete, Sirius said. Not unless you want me to. No, please don't, Remus said. I'm not, I'm not ashamed. It's just private, you know? Sirius nodded, pursing his lips. It's safe with me. Remus, still feeling a bit shaky, gave a weak smile. God, you're so dramatic. Sirius laughed too. James's mum says I wear my heart on my sleeve. He nudged Remus with his toe. We can't all be master secret keepers like you, Mooney. I thought it wasn't me without secrets. Yeah, but if you have to have them, I'd rather I knew. Remus snorted. Because you're so special, Black. Because if I don't know, I'll just try to figure it out anyway. Like you and your little cigarette-selling enterprise. Remus's mouth dropped open. You looked in my trunk, you wanker. How dare you, Sirius replied haughtily. I would never stoop so low. One of the six-year lads came round asking for you, see if you were still selling this year. Remus groaned, slapping his forehead. Was it Dirk Cresswell, bloody moron? How much did you make? Enough. Please don't tell James. You know what he's like about stealing. You stole them! Oh, bollocks. Remus groaned again at his own stupidity. I don't know how you do it, Mooney, Sirius said, awed. But you surprise me every time. Chapter 59, Fourth Year, September Remus never did find out exactly what it was Mary had done, or had done to her, over the summer holidays. Whatever it was, though, it had given her a certain amount of status among the other girls in their year group, which was hard to ignore. On Thursday, their first lesson of the term with Professor Ferox, Remus arrived at the classroom to find a cluster of girls whispering near his desk. He elbowed his way through, grumpily, reclaiming his workspace next to Mary. The girl tittered and resumed whispering. Mary, of course, 
was at the centre of the group, holding court and, by the looks of it, having a thoroughly marvellous time. Marlene, sitting by, was watching on with a look of envy and respect. And it didn't hurt, a Ravenclaw girl asked in a hushed tone. Nah, it's fine if you relax, Mary replied, with a bravado that reminded Remus of James. Do you think you're going to, you know, with Darren? Another girl asked, her voice practically trembling with excitement. Well, I... Mary started, but at that moment Professor Furox emerged from his office, announcing his presence with a cheerful salutation. Welcome back, class. Seats, please. The girls all hurried into place, some looking very red-faced and others unable to stop giggling. Remus frowned, trying to ignore them, and sat facing the front, back straight. Ferox gave him a friendly smile and nod, and Remus nodded back, smiling uncontrollably. Ferox had clearly had a fantastic summer. His fair hair was a shade brighter, no doubt bleached by the sun. It was longer, and he now wore it twisted back in a long knotted tail. His face was even more weather-beaten, and his nose rather red and peeling slightly from sunburn. He'd rolled up his sleeves, as usual, revealing sun-brown arms and the odd burn mark. "'Good summer?' he asked the class, who all nodded and murmured in the affirmative. He grinned and clapped his hands together. "'Excellent. I hope you all had a nice long rest, and you're ready to begin work on four X-rated creatures this term. First, let's do a quick recap of last term's work, then see who's done their summer reading.' Remus himself had only just finished reading that morning, and hadn't even started on the extra text Ferox had lent him. He sorely regretted wasting the whole summer being reckless now, and had already had to plead with Professor McGonagall to let him have an extra week on his transfiguration notes. He suspected that she had only relented after a conversation with Madame Pomfrey, which made him feel guiltier still, as he knew he was capable of beating most of the class, even after his very worst transformations. You're being too tough on yourself, Sirius told him, as they were chased out of the common room the night before by prefects telling them to go to bed. It's the beginning of the year. If you're going to fuck up, you may as well fuck up now. Remus had just glared at him. Easy for you to say. Some of us actually have to work for our grades. Plus, it's owls next year. I can't drop my standards now. Ugh, please don't mention owls, James said coming between them quickly in a less than subtle attempt to prevent an argument. McGonagall and Flitwick have already put the fear in me. And why did we decide to do divination? I quite like divination, Peter said thoughtfully, dumping his pile of books. Prophecies and that, it's exciting. It's nonsense. Sirius gave the smallest marauder a withering look. You only like it because you're good at astronomy. It's not just that, James said slyly, changing into his pyjamas. Notice that Pete's got a new partner this year. Oh yes, Sirius smirked. The divine Desdemona Lewis of Ravenclaw. Remus glanced up at Peter in surprise and watched him turn a shocking shade of scarlet from his blue pyjama collar to the roots of his yellow hair. Shut up, he mumbled, climbing into bed. She's just a friend. James, Sirius said in a very solemn voice. What on earth are we going to do if Petey Boy here gets a proper snog before any of us? Well, your reputation would be in tatters for one thing, James replied in the same serious manner. What do I have if not my reputation? Sirius grinned back, getting himself into bed. Remus huffed with disapproval and pulled hard on his bed curtains, returning to his book and hoping they all got the message. If they did, it didn't matter. Of course, if I got a snog before you, that wouldn't hurt, James said. I'm on the Quidditch team. You don't have my animal magnetism, Sirius replied. There was a loud thump and oi! And Remus assumed that James's pillow had crossed the room and made contact with Sirius's head. I bet you, James started. 
Oh no, Peter groaned. Please don't. I bet you ten galleons that I can get a girl to snog me within a month. Ten? Peter gasped. Done, Sirius called back. Just you wait, Potter. Remus, who had lost all ability to concentrate on his book, huffed loudly again and decided to sleep. Pathetic. It wasn't just the girls anymore. Now even the marauders were obsessed with snogging. It probably would be Sirius who won the bet. Though James had a fair point about the Quidditch team. He felt sorry for Peter, who had gone very quiet. Rumours tried not to think about the fact that none of his friends had made any comments on his likeliness to get a snog. He must rank even lower than he thought. Remus was troubled by this all week, right up to his Care of Magical Creatures lesson, which he now found himself daydreaming through. As Ferox's lecture drew to a close, Remus realised he had made no notes at all. He looked down, panicked, and saw a neatly folded piece of parchment. Who had put that there? He glanced around furtively, then opened it. Please tell Sirius, I think he's gorgeous. Effie thumped scorn. Heat flared up his neck as Remus screwed the note up into a ball and shoved it into his pocket. That settled it. Everyone had lost their minds. As well as contending with the raging hormones which now seemed to infect every one of Remus's social circle, there was another noticeable change in the atmosphere at Hogwarts. Even if James had not explained to him that the wizarding world was at war, Remus thought he would have worked it out for himself this year. The Slytherins, who had always considered themselves a cut above the other houses, and had therefore maintained a certain distance, had retreated even further into themselves now. They gathered in huddles in the classrooms, kept to their common room, and moved through the corridors in ominous groups. Muggleborn students were also travelling in packs, Remus had noticed, and the teachers seemed to be making their presence known more than they had in previous years. This did not stop certain incidents from taking place, however. Anyone who was not a pureblood quickly became apt at defensive spells, and even the marauders had swapped pranks for protection. Where are the bloody prefects when you need them? James complained, having just fired off a few well-placed Ingorgio charms at a group of six-year Slytherins who were tormenting a first-year Hufflepuff. The green-robed teens were running away now, clutching their various rapidly swelling extremities. I think even the prefects are scared, Sirius replied, leaning against the wall, looking bored as James helped the Hufflepuff to his feet. Cowards. All they can do is hand out detentions and take house points, Remus added. And I don't think the Slytherins even care about those anymore. I heard Mulciber last week saying they should all put up with the trivial punishment for the promise of a greater reward. Mulciber said that? Sirius arched an eyebrow. Bloody hell, he's more eloquent than I gave him credit for. Yeah, or he's parroting back something someone else has told him, James countered, watching the Hufflepuff scurry away down towards the kitchens. What do you think the reward is? Pete asked, scruffing his toe on the flagstones. Money, power, eternal life, Sirius sighed, rolling away from the wall and swaggering up the corridor. Godric knows. They won't get it, though. Why not? Because, Petey boy, we're going to win. By the end of September, Snape had still not made his move. This put Remus somewhat on edge, and he wondered whether that was the intention. Their only shared lessons this year were potions and arithmancy. Arithmancy was fortunately a relatively quiet class, which mainly involved taking down notes and figuring out equations. Potions, being more practical, gave Snape, and the Slytherins as a whole, scope for much greater interference. As they had agreed on the first day of term, Lily and Remus became partners, sharing a cauldron and dividing up notes and directions. This clearly infuriated Snape, who barely took his eyes off them the whole time. However, Remus had to admit that this appeared to have less to do with him than it did with Lily herself. Have you two fallen out or something? 
Remus asked, one afternoon as Severus shoved his way past them to the dungeons. Lily sighed warily. No, not exactly, she said. He got annoyed when I had Mary and Marlene visit over the summer, that's all. Thinks they're not the right sort. I have to keep reminding him that I'm a muggle-born too. Why'd you put up with it? I don't, really, she replied, sounding sad. I always have a go at him when he spouts that pure-blood nonsense, and sometimes I think he listens to me, but, well, it's not easy for him, you know? James was not making things easier. Anyone could see that. He and Sirius had conveniently set up their own cauldron next to Remus and Lily's, and ever since they'd made their bet, James's pursuance of Lily had dialed up a knot. Now, James Potter was a true star on the Quidditch pitch. That much could not be denied. He was elegant and graceful. He thought tactically and moved with simple subtlety. When it came to Lily, he was none of these things. Give us a snog, Evans, he tried during their first lesson. Lily was so appalled that she swished her wand fiercely through the air, upturning the contents of Potter's cauldron. He and Sirius were stained bright blue for an entire week. The following week, undaunted, James tried again. This time, he had consulted his father, who had suggested that he try complimenting the object of his affections. I really like your hair, he said confidently, as soon as she approached the workbench. Hmm she responded, not looking up. Yeah, it's so, um, ginger. Remus saw Lily's jaw tighten. She hated being called ginger. She'd told him once that she'd been teased for her hair in primary school. Remus took a step back, seeing Lily reach for her wand as she turned towards James with a false smile. Like it that much, do you? she asked. Sirius, who had been watching Remus, took a step back as well. Poor James was too excited to finally have her attention, and nodded vigorously. Oh yeah, I think it's Refusio, Lily said, pointing her wand at him. Sirius gawfed so loudly that half of the class turned to look, and Remus had to cover his mouth to hide his own laughter. James's confusion made it even funnier, until Marlene handed him her compact mirror so that he could see his new bright red hair. It took 48 hours to wear off, but it was no good. Even after two full days of being called Ginger Nut and Carrot Top, among some slightly other ruder nicknames, wherever he went, James remained completely unshaken in his adoration. I just got to be patient, he said dreamily, running a hand through his messy auburn locks. Nothing worth having isn't worth waiting for. It's kind of impressive. Sirius whispered loudly to the others. I sort of don't want to win the bet, because he's made it too easy. Yeah, James snorted. That's why. Oh, suck it, copper knob. End of chapter 59